Well, it's good to be back at the Jewish Museum in Hernams, especially, as Hanno said, as the last time I was here, I wasn't here. Um, it was last June when the museum mounted the exhibition, The Last Europeans, as Hanno has just explained. And because of the COVID pandemic, I was at home in London speaking on Zoom. Now, Zoom is fine. If sitting at a desk, staring at your own face on the screen in front of you is your thing, but it isn't mine. It feels, how shall I put it, uh, fake. I prefer being really here at this real podium, looking out at all your real faces and enjoying ein Krug echtes Bier together <laughs> afterwards rather than making a cup of tea for myself and drinking it alone in my kitchen. So, as I say, it's good to be back. My lecture this evening is, in a way, a continuation of the lecture I gave the last time I was or wasn't here. Last year's lecture was on the so-called Jewish question, and tonight's is on the question of the so-called Jew, the fake or fictional or illusory Jew, or the word I prefer for reasons I shall give later, the mythical Jew, which is why the title changed, eventually ending up uh, as the mythical Jew. So, um, The two topics, sorry, I lost my place. The two topics are closely connected, the Jewish question and the question of the so-called Jew. So, as the mythical Jew is at the heart of the so-called Jewish question. So, they overlap a little. And let me begin by explaining the role of my lecture this evening as I see it in the summer university. The overall theme of the week, of course, is fake. Fake in connection with Jews, Jewishness, and perhaps Judaism. <clears throat> Today is the opening day, and I see what I am doing tonight as an attempt to open up discussion. Nothing more, nothing less. I am not in the business of making an argument here with a beginning, a middle, and a neat and tidy conclusion. There is no conclusion. My aim is purely to reflect on the overall theme, fake, and hope in the process to say something that is useful to you. I shall go where reflection happens to take me, and when it stops, so shall I. At one point in Plato's dialogue, Euthyphro, Socrates utters a beautiful and memorable line. He says, and I quote, the lover of inquiry must follow his beloved wherever it leads him. In other words, pursue the question regardless, no matter the twists and turns in the road. I think of his modus operandi as meaningful meandering or wandering with a will. In this lecture, I shall, as a Jew, wander like a Greek, somewhat in the spirit of Socrates. I shall follow my nose, and since I am the one who said that, it's not anti-Semitic. Now, if this leads you to pause and to ponder the meaning of fake, if it whets your appetite for the lectures, seminars, and workshops to come over the next few days, then I shall feel that I have done my job and earns the drink that Hanno wants to buy me. <clears throat> Fake. The word refers to something that is false or fictitious, but at least in English, it means more than merely false. It implies a conscious intention to deceive. Think of a fake masterpiece, or a fake credit card, or something we hear a lot about these days, fake news. In all these cases, 
there is, I think, an implication that someone is trying to pull the wool over somebody else's eyes. My talk is about Jews, not news. And in this context, too, fake means more than merely fictitious or false. But the more, the factor that is added to the fiction of the Jew, is not conscious intention. It is, so to speak, cultural intention. The fake Jew that we encounter in the script of anti-Semitism, sinister, clannish, rootless, parasitic, cunning, devious, money-grubbing, power-grabbing, you can probably continue the list of adjectives, is not invented but inherited, passed down from one generation to another in folklore, jokes, legends and anecdotes literature and art, philosophical works, and religious sermons. No one sits down and designs the fake Jew the way a forger forges a credit card or a masterpiece of art. Rather, the fake Jew is something that everyone inhales, for it is in the air. It is more a legacy of a general culture, the culture of a society, or even an entire civilization than the cynical product of a particular individual or group with an ulterior motive. Which does not mean that the fake figure of the Jew cannot be exploited deliberately to promote a sinister agenda, political or otherwise. Of course it can be, of course it has been, of course it is and undoubtedly in the future it will be. But the figure itself is not fabricated, it is ready-made, lying around in our culture, waiting to be put to use. Fake Jews are not news, they are all too familiar. That said, the anti-Semitic figure of the Jew has a twin, and Hanno has already anticipated this. For the sake of convenience, let us call this twin the philo-Semitic figure of the Jew. And I notice, Hanno, you hesitated on the use of that word, as do I. I'm not sure that philo-Semitism is always the right term to use, but let's set that aside this evening and use it as a convenient label. Like Apollo and Artemis, divine twins in Greek myth, the one representing day, the other night, the two figures of the Jew, philo-Semitic and anti-Semitic, are opposites. But are they opposites? There is a Jewish joke that bears on this issue. Question, which is preferable, the anti-Semite or the philo-Semite? Answer, the anti-Semite. At least she or he isn't lying. Now, <laughs> this suggests that the philo-Semite is, to use our word of the week, faking it pretending to be the opposite of what he or she is, actually. But now consider this Jewish joke. Question, what is a philo-Semite? Answer, an anti-Semite who loves Jews. <laughs> now, I prefer the second joke. It goes deeper. It suggests that the philo-Semite is not being duplicitous or mendacious, in other words, is she or he is not lying. Rather, au fond, at depth, philo-Semitism and anti-Semitism are not two opposite sides of one coin, but two different forms of the same thing. And what might that same thing be? <clears throat> well, this question is a cue for a personal anecdote. Some years ago, I took part in a BBC Radio 4 programme called Beyond Belief. And this particular episode was on the subject of Christian Zionism. Including the presenter, there were four of us in the studio. One of the others was a gospel minister from Manchester. On theological grounds, he was a committed Zionist. The fourth person, by the way, was the author of a book about Christian Zionism, which at the time had only just been published. 
I, as a Christian, said the minister, love the Jews unconditionally because Jesus loved the Jewish people. End of quote. Well, I suppose that makes Jesus a Philo-Semite and very possibly the first in history. I mean, if you go back further, I wouldn't say that Moses was exactly a fan of the Israelites, not judging by his frequent complaints about them to God. Whether for that matter God loved them is a moot point. It's hard to love a people that loves a golden calf instead of you. But getting back to the BBC program, it is amazing what forms unconditional love can take. On the one hand, alluding to the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, the Christian minister from Manchester said, I quote him, we oppose land for peace because God promised this land to the Jews, end of quote. What he didn't quite say, on the other hand, was that the whole point of this promise on his reading of the scriptures is to give the mass of Jews one last chance to see the Christian light, to transcend their Jewish identity, to cease to be Jews, to become non-Jews or not Jews. Alternatively, as a result of their stubbornness, to be eternally damned. Now this is what must be meant by the English idiom to love someone to death. <laughs> Setting aside the element of damnation, the minister's view was a variation on a theme that frequently is found in the discourse of philo-Semitism. Jews are transfigured <laughs> into something higher than Jewish, as it were. For, as, for example, I've argued elsewhere um, is the hero of Lessing's Nathan the Wise. And I will be referring to Lessing's play a couple of times later, but I won't be explaining why I think what I just said I have argued. Uh, that's too complicated. But I think someone later on the program is giving a talk on Lessing's play. I'm not sure. Anyway. Anyway, back to the studio. I protested to the minister that he was viewing us. Now, I'm able to quote myself here, not because I can remember what I said, but because a reporter from the Jewish Chronicle, which is the mainstream Jewish newspaper in Britain, listened to the program and reported it um, in an article in the Jewish Chronicle. And I found this article recently, even though this goes back about 15 years. Um, and so I'm able to quote myself for that reason. I protested to this minister that he was viewing us Jews I quote, <laughs> as something larger than life. I added, quoting myself again, we don't want to be ciphers for large metaphysical dramas. In, in other words, we don't want to be symbols that can be interpreted in terms of large metaphysical dramas like the apocalypse. As for his unconditional love for the Jews, I told him and through him the listeners to the um, Radio 4 program, quote, to be loved and to be hated can be similar fates. One can turn into the other. <clears throat> By the way, it can happen both ways. Hate can turn into love, as we shall see. And I illustrated the point by using a metaphor that a Christian minister, someone versed in the theology of a fall from grace, might appreciate. I said, and I quote, when you put people on a pedestal, they are liable to fall down. Not in reality, of course, but in the eyes of the person who put them on the pedestal. Now, it's nice of the minister to elevate us Jews collectively to a place that is above common humanity. But where will we end up? Perhaps where the renowned poet T.S. Eliot placed us in his poem, Burbank with a Baedeker, Blestein with a Cigar. He said, and I quote from the poem, the rats are underneath the piles, the Jew is underneath the lot. That's T.S. Eliot, fine poet. Plummeting from a place closer to heaven to a hole nearer to hell, that's the risk you run when you are seen 
as something larger than life. Both places are false. Both images of the Jew are fictions. <clears throat> That's what they have in common. Now, as I started to say, the reversal can occur in reverse. It can take the fiction of the Jew from lower to higher. Which brings me to a bend in the road, a detour, signposted Europe and the Jewish question. Now, whether I am wandering with a will, like Socrates, or pursuing a will of the wisp, an illusion, I am not sure, but I must, as I said at the beginning, follow my nose, and my nose takes me in the direction of Europe. It takes me here, I emphasize here, because unfortunately, my country is no longer part of what most of us recognize as Europe, I regret to say. And it's nice to be back in Europe, by the way. <laughs> Europe is where the reverse of the reversal occurs on the grandest scale. It is here, with the creation of the so-called New Europe after the Second World War, that Eliot's fiction of the Jew as subhuman or sub-rodent is replaced by the fiction of the idealized Jew, where the Jew who is lower than common humanity becomes the Jew who is higher than common humanity. Compared with the studio in which I met the minister from Manchester, Europe is a big place. So before I go any further, let me enter a disclaimer. The story I am about to tell about Europe and the Jews is oversimplified and highly selective. But I would, I would argue it isn't fake. It is not manufactured. And it is true enough, I think, for our purposes here this evening. So to any historians in the room, and I know there are several, which is why I'm saying this, to try and spare my blushes. To any historians in the room, I say, when I tell the story I am about to tell, and I'm no historian, please don't groan too loudly. <laughs> I shall welcome corrections with open arms, but in return, I ask you to hear the narrative with open minds. Open to the point that there is a point to telling the narrative in the way in which I'm going to tell it. The narrative about Europe and the Jews. The Jewish question. What was it? Well, that's a good question. And the first thing to be said is that it was precisely not a Jewish question. It was not a question that Jews themselves asked. It was a question Europe asked. And although ostensibly it was about the Jews, Ultimately, it was about Europe. It was about Europe via the question of the Jews. For this reason, the Jewish question should be renamed the European question. The question has always been about the identity of Europe. Ever since antiquity and the days of the original European Union, as it were, the one whose capital city was Rome, Anti-Jewish animus or hatred is older than the Roman Empire, but the story I have in mind begins with the conversion to Christianity of Flavius Valerius Constantinus, otherwise known as Constantine the Great, Emperor of Rome. Constantine's conversion on his deathbed gave birth, in a way, to the European or Jewish question. The question, what is Europe? Europe's answer to its own question, put negatively, was this, not Jewish. Not Jewish meant different things at different times. Though the name Jewish remained constant, the thing it named kept changing, not in reality, but seen through European eyes. The thing it named, Judaism or being Jewish, this was essentially a fiction, even when it happened to coincide with fact. When I say it was essentially a fiction, I'm referring, of course, to the image of Judaism or Jewishness that was being negated in order to affirm or um, 
clarify um, Europe's own sense of its own identity. So even, it, it was, this image was essentially a fiction, even when it happened to coincide with fact. And this is important, I will come back to this complication later. So it was a fact that the church was not the synagogue. But this not, not the synagogue, in a way changed the very thing it was negating. When Christianity laid eyes on Judaism, it saw something made in its own image, something that was, from the outset, fake. The look of Judaism was detached from the thing itself. This look took on the role of a foil, the foil against which Europe in antiquity defined itself as Christian. This turned out to be a prototype for the European future. Europe in modernity donned different identities. There were different positives, but they shared the same negative, not Jewish. Thus, in the 18th century, when Europe woke up to the new dawn of enlightenment, Jews remained the dark spot. But their darkness took a different form from the form it had taken prior to the Enlightenment when Europe, uh, 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 in general, saw itself as Christian. That is to say, the fiction of the Jew in the European gaze was refashioned to fit the needs of a new European era, the era of the Enlightenment. Esther Romain explains, and I quote her, for the Enlightenment, with its investment in universalism and civilization, the Jew was a symbol of particularism, a backward-looking, pre-modern, tribal culture of outmoded customs and religious tutelage. End of quote. Just as Christian Europe was not Jewish, so enlightened Europe was not Jewish. The not was, so to speak, internal to Europe's changing identity. I'm well aware of the fact that there were Jews who were involved in promoting and developing the Enlightenment. And I'm thinking also of the Haskalah, the Enlightenment within Jewish circles. I know that we could spend the rest of the day and indeed the rest of the week discussing and situating these complications. But as I said earlier, I'm deliberately painting with broad brushstrokes for the sake of getting an overall picture that I think helps to get the idea of the fake Jew in perspective. Now this not, enlightened Europe not being not Jewish, was, so to speak, internal to Europe's changing identity, not just with the Enlightenment. Jews were the them inside the us. This, by the way, is an important difference about which I spoke just last week at a conference at Zurich that Sarah Warren, Warren here organized, um, of an important difference between the place of Jews and the place of, shall we say, peoples in the global south in relation to Europe. Whereas the latter uh, tend to be the external them to Europe's us, Jews were the internal them. Jews were never colonized. They weren't a colonized people. They were living in Europe. And I think this difference is a difference that makes a huge difference to the debate, Hanno alluded to this, about racism and anti-Semitism and related debates, including a debate about the Middle Eastern conflict, in ways in which I will not even dream of getting into this evening. So I was saying Jews were the them inside the us. They were the other within, as alien as the alien race in the 1960 horror film, Village of the Damned. There may not be many people in the room who will get that reference, but if you haven't seen it, you might be able to find it on YouTube, and it's worth watching just because it's so hokey. Now, in the words of the historian Adam Sutcliffe, the Jews were, and I quote him, the Enlightenment's primary unassimilable other, the other that cannot be assimilated. Well, of course they were unassimilable. They were cast as unassimilable. Unless, of course, they changed radically and, in effect, shed their Jewishness, as with 
the, as with Lessing's nation, uh, Nathan, <laughs> and as with the uh, ultimate meaning of the Man minister from Manchester's Christian Zionism. The Jews were given an identity that would enable them to play the role of other that was assigned to them, the role of being antithetical to enlightenment, thereby illuminating what enlightenment was. In the following century, the 19th, the Jewish symbol was turned on its head. Let me quote Esther Romain again. For a nationalism based on roots, the distinctiveness of cultures, and allegiance to a shared past, the Jew was an uprooted nomad, or a suspect cosmopolitan, aligned with abstract reason rather than roots and tradition. End of quote. As the European question took on a new form, so did its negative answer. Europe's not being Jewish meant different things in different eras, which means that being Jewish was, for Europe, a movable feast. One fiction of the Jew took the place of another, always for Europe's sake, always for the purpose of providing an answer to the European question which Europe concealed from itself by naming or misnaming its question as Jewish. Now let's stop and take stock of this oversimplified, overgeneralized story about Europe and the part that the Jews play in it. They do not play a part as the Jews that they are but as they are seen. And I shall return to this distinction, which is not as simple as it might sound later. To put it the other way around, the Jews as they are seen are not merely an image in the European imagination. They play a part in the story that Europe tells itself about itself. They have a vital role to play, a function to perform as the internal other for Europe, as the negative to Europe's positive. And this is why I said at the beginning, and I thank you, Hannah, for uh, acquainting the room with my latest and final title. This is why I said at the beginning that I prefer to speak of the mythical Jew rather than the fake, fictional, or illusory Jew, even though these words all overlap. It is true that the word myth can be used to mean the same thing as fiction, as in the myth that everyone in England takes tea at four o'clock in the afternoon. Not true. Or the myth that British prime ministers are never clowns or buffoons. Most definitely not true, if you've been reading the newspapers lately. But this is an impoverished sense of the word myth. In its full and richer sense, a myth is a story or an image that structures our view of the world or of ourselves. It is not mere fiction, it is fiction plus function. Function that functions at a deeper, deeper level than empirical facts, suffusing the facts with significance, suspending them in a medium of meaning. The fictions of the Jew over the centuries, which are not anybody's contrivance, as I said at the beginning, but are embedded in European culture, are in this sense of the word mythical. The Jews in the daydreams of Europe down the centuries are not real Jews. They are fake. They are the negative, the internal negative, to Europe's positive. Jews belong in Europe by not belonging at least they did, right? This is the mythical Jew. Then in the second half of the 20th century, from the devastation of the Second World War and the horrors of Auschwitz, a new Europe rises like a phoenix from the ashes. Does this spell the end of the mythical Jew? Are we Jews as Jews released 
from playing a vital role in Europe's definition of itself, not a bit of it. What happens is what earlier I called a reversal, flipping the fiction of the Jew from lower status to higher. The mythical Jew lives on today, but as a reformed character. In his final year as president of the European Commission, Romano Prodi gave a speech in Brussels about what he called the European idea. He meant the idea of Europe post-war, the new Europe that supersedes the old. The Europe of today, he said, and I'm quoting him, is not the Europe of the 1930s and 1940s, end of quote, nor for that matter is it the Europe that had existed for nearly two millennia, the Europe of states that were repeatedly in conflict and even at war with each other. The European idea, and I'm quoting him again, he explained, was based on the firm determination to make sure that the Europe of the future would be different, a Europe of peace, tolerance, and respect for human rights, end of quote. A different Europe and concomitantly a different place for Jews in the European imagination. Ladies and gentlemen, Prodi said, and I'm quoting, I believe we can learn a lot from the history of the Jews of Europe. In many ways, he continued, and I'm quoting him still, they are the first, the oldest Europeans, end of quote. The first Europeans become, in his speech, the foremost Europeans, a model that every other European should emulate. And I'm now drawing rather heavily on last year's lecture, so if you heard or read that lecture, please bear with me. Only for a bit, okay. Now, I'm interrupting Prodi. Let's hear what Prodi goes on to say at once. Quote, we, the new Europeans, are just starting to learn the complex art of living with multiple allegiances. End of quote. We can learn, therefore, from the Jews, as the Jews, quoting Prodi again, have been forced to master this art since antiquity. End of quote. He is unstinting with his praise. Quote him again. The Jews of Europe have made an immense contribution to European culture. End of quote. Not only as individuals, he says, quote, but also as a community, as a collective. The values, and I'm quoting him once more, the values that have guided them through the centuries, he adds, have provided a reference for us. Now note that the entire passage is structured by the grammar of us and them. And so on and so forth. Now it's nice to be praised and admired. A little embarrassing to be held up as a model for others to emulate, but there's no denying that it is a compliment. It is certainly not a put-down. There is, however, a difference between being admired and praised for what you personally have done or achieved, or even for what has been accomplished by a particular group of people of which you are a part. But it is quite another thing to be merged with a mass defined by a name and an identity that someone else attaches to your name. Uh, this is a point to which I shall re shortly return. Nice as Prodi's testimonial to the Jews of Europe is, it is also somehow unsettling. It certainly makes me, as a European Jew, uncomfortable. Once again, Jews as a group are singled out. Where we were once negated, now we are affirmed, lifted out of Europe's gutter and placed on its pedestal. Setting out to right a wrong, Prodi reproduces the very essence of that wrong, separating us Jews from common humanity by a set of traits we possess collectively because we are Jewish. Like the minister from Manchester, he sees us as something larger than life. What is this if not a new variation on the theme of Jewish otherness? I suppose it is better to be idealized than demonized, 
But better still is to be normalized, to be freed from the burden of being a myth, a myth for someone else. Now, unless I am mistaken, a number of people in the room at this point are beginning to get restless. But is it a myth, is what they are itching to say. Let me quote the people in the room who are not saying this but thinking it. Isn't much of what Prodi said about the Jews of Europe simply true? Didn't they learn to live with multiple allegiances? Haven't Jews, as a matter of fact, made an immense contribution to European culture, Brody's words, especially considering that there are relatively few of them as a proportion of the whole population of Europe at any given time down the centuries. Okay, to continue what this silent voice is thinking, okay, perhaps Prodi exaggerates and perhaps he overgeneralizes, but we all do from time to time. That doesn't make us myth makers. This is not me speaking, okay? I am speaking the voice that I'm hearing in my head that someone else or several people in the room are speaking in their head, I think. We all do this, exaggerate and overgeneralize. That doesn't make us myth makers. It just means we're being sloppy about what we say. You, me, me, are being too hard on Prodi. You're making a matzo pudding out of his speech. Calm down. Okay, end of the pseudo quote. Well, whoever you are in the audience who is thinking this, I'm glad you are, and I'm grateful to you for permitting me to give voice to your thoughts, because what you are thinking brings me to another bend in the road of my lecture and prompts me to reflect further on the nature of the mythical and, for that matter, the meaning of fake. There are complications that, so far, I have glossed over and which we need, I think, to keep in mind over the next few days, three in particular. Let's start with the word fake. The complication that occurs to me is this. A fake copy of something is sometimes indistinguishable from the original. Now, what I have in mind goes beyond the kind of case where even an expert cannot tell the two apart. You get that often with forgeries of old masters in art and the problem of trying to distinguish the original from the copy. But that's not what I have in mind goes much further than that. I am thinking of cases where the very distinction between original and imitation is cast into doubt. A good example is provided by the three rings in the parable that Nathan tells in Lessing's play. I shall retell the parable in an abbreviated form using, where possible, Nathan's own words in the translation by Ronald Schechter, but leaving out the moral of the tale because the moral of the tale is not germane to what I'm arguing this evening, um, and I don't want to confuse the issue. So here is an abbreviated um, version of the parable of the three rings. Nathan is delivering this. Many years ago in the East, there lived a man who owned a, a ring of inestimable worth, which had the power of making whoever wore it agreeable to God and human beings. The man left the ring to his favorite son, stipulating that he, he should, in turn, leave it to his favorite son, and so on from one generation to the next. Daughters, of course, didn't come into it at that time. The ring went in this way from son to son, from generation to generation, until it came to a father who had three sons, whom he loved equally. So he, the father had two identical duplicate rings made. He himself could not tell them apart and gave one ring to each of the three sons. The sons squabbled over who had the true, the original ring. But in vain, they couldn't settle it. The true ring was indistinguishable. The sons sued each other. Each, that's pretty realistic, each accusing the other two of fraud. The judge, who heard the case at the end of the hearing, concluded that all three rings are false 
and that the real ring must have been lost. End of story. Nathan uses the parable to make a point about what it means or doesn't mean to say that one religion, Christianity, Islam, or Judaism, those are the three that enter into the action of the play, whether one religion is the true religion and the other's false. But I am using the story for a different purpose, to make a point about the meaning of the word fake or the concept fake. Does it, in a case like this, have a meaning? What is the difference between saying that one of the three rings is the true ring and the others are fakes? Or, as the judge has it, all three rings are fakes and the true ring is lost. Is there any distinction here between true and fake? I don't have an answer to this question. I'm not even sure what bearing it has, if any, um, on our deliberations about fake. But I said I would go where reflection happens to take me and that I would follow my beloved wherever it leads, and it's divert, diverted me here. So in the course of the week, perhaps someone will ponder this conundrum and maybe find this digression is relevant to discussions uh, here at the Summer University. And I, I would certainly like to think so, but I'm just going to throw it out into the room and offer this as something, as I say, to ponder cases where the distinction between original and fake actually is meaningless. Now, more relevant to our proceedings this week, I think, is a complication about the nature of the mythical. Earlier, I defined a myth as fiction plus function, a fiction that functions at a deeper level than empirical facts. But this isn't quite accurate. It is even a little misleading. For one thing, there is sometimes a kind of collusion between fact and myth, and for another, even the empirical can function as the mythical. Now, these are two different points. I want to take them separately. Let's take first the collusion, but the collusion, as I'm calling it, between fact and myth. This is my cue to say to you, by the way, that I admire more than I can say, even in English, the way in which you all put up with me speaking in my own tongue rather than in German. I think it's incredibly chutzpahdick of me to come to Hernum's and lecture in English and amazingly generous of you to let me. I admire your command of the language which I, like a true Brit, not a fake one, cannot uh, when I cannot speak yours, nor anyone else's. But there is, I suspect, an English word with which even you might not be familiar. It's the word Rachmanism. R-A-C-H-M-A-N-I-S-M. Rachmanism. Rachmanism is defined in the shorter Oxford Dictionary as exploitation or intimidation of a slum tenant by an unscrupulous landlord. Where, you might ask, does the word come from? It comes from a name, the name Rackman. Peter Rackman was a landlord who ruled over a property empire based in the Notting Hill area of West London, charging low-income tenants high rents that they could barely afford. He was notorious in England, and I still remember him vaguely from my childhood. His exploits, or exploitations, led to the Rent Act of 1965, which gave tenants security of tenure to protect them against people like him. He was a notorious figure in my youth, as I've said. He was rich, and he was Jewish. He was Jewish, and he was money-grubbing, unscrupulous, shady, and a predator on the poor. These are facts. They are simultaneously stock themes in the negative stereotype of the Jew. Put it this way. He was Jewish, and he was Jewish, in scare quotes. The real identity and the mythical image met in this man. In a case like this, you could say, the image fastens onto the reality, so to speak. The image uses the reality to proclaim itself falsely as real. In other words, people would point to someone like Rackman and say, you see, that's what Jews are like. 
And what they were pointing to was someone who really did correspond to the negative stereotype of the Jew. But that doesn't mean that the negative stereotype is valid. That's the point I'm trying to make. Empirical fact is not necessarily false exactly in relation to a myth. So fiction and fact are not always distinct, let alone opposed. Richmond's case is neither fact merely nor fiction exactly. So you could call it faction or fict. And by the way, exactly the same sort of thing happens with Islamophobia. Um, and I wrote a piece showing the parallel. How, just as in the Jewish case, so in the Muslim case also, you get these cases where, as it were, individual, real individual Muslims act in ways that correspond to the negative stereotype of the Muslim, just as real, in this case, a real uh, individual Jew acted according to the stereo negative stereotype of the Jew. Now the third complication, I said there were three complications that were prompted by the um, intervention made by the silent voice in the room. The third complication is the one that brings us back to the point in the road where I veered off into this path. I was commenting, you might recall, on Romano Prodi's speech and his fulsome praise of the Jews of Europe. My take on his vision for Europe, just to remind you, is this. The transition from old Europe to new that he describes does not normalize Jewish status, but simply recalibrates Jewish otherness. Instead of despised foil, which is what we once were, we become admired model. In the final analysis, we, the Jews, remain on the plane of myth, serving a European purpose. Now, the silent voice in the room, you recall, did not agree with me, or the silent voices did not, do, did, do not agree with me. They say that we should make allowance for a degree of hyperbole on Prodin's part, and that the positive things he said about the Jews are, by and large, factually true. Okay, I'm just trying to remind us all of the point at which I went off along, around this bend in the road. I've now come back to the main uh, path. Now, to this objection, here's my reply. Whether they are factually true or not, that's to say, um, the things that Prodi says about, the, European, about European, the Jews of Europe, whether they are factually true or not is beside the point. As we saw in the case of Peter Rackman, the empirical can coincide with the mythical. And similarly, the empirical can function as the miracle, as the mythical. <laughs> to put it another way, a factual discourse can transcend itself and operate on the mind in another way altogether, forming habits, digging ruts, in which the mind and heart of a person or an entire culture get stuck. Fact, in short, can turn into myth. The real Jew can turn into a fake. That's what I believe is happening before our very eyes in the benign and benevolent words uttered by Romano Prodi. Now, I said at the outset that I would go where reflection happens to take me, and when it stops, so shall I. I think we are reaching that point. Except that all of a sudden, I find myself at a junction again in the road, and before me, there's an enormous highway, not just another pathway. I have been speaking about the fake Jew, but what about the real Jew? Surely it is necessary to bring the latter into focus in order to discern the former. Well, I'm not so sure that's true, but in any case, I'm certain that if I start to go down that road, we will be here all night, in fact, all week. <laughs> I shall, however, say this. Jewish identity cannot be filed under any of the customary headings, whether religion or faith or culture or ethnicity or, God forbid, race. It is the Houdini of identities, always escaping the boxes into which it is put. 
And also, there is no such person as the real Jew. Jews, like ice cream, come in many different flavors. There are, however, two or three definitions that I rather like, and this is the note upon which I'm going to bring the lecture to a close. So the question is, who is a, not the, but who is a real Jew? That's to say, not a fake Jew. Rabbi Yohanan in the Talmud says, whoever rejects idolatry is called a Jew. That's one definition I rather like. The essayist George Steiner defines a Jew as someone who, and I quote him, always has a pencil or pen in hand when reading. I particularly like that definition. <laughs> and then there is this truly Jewish answer. A real Jew is someone who disagrees with other Jews about who is a real Jew. <laughs> or simply someone who disagrees with other Jews. Now, by way of illustration, I shall close my lecture with one final Jewish joke. Rabbi Yitzchok and Rabbi Yehuda were both Talmudei Chachomim, scholars of the Torah, and respected leaders of their community. However, like the House of Hillel and the House of Shammai in the Mishnah, they took opposite sides on every question. One day, Naftali, or Naftali, the humble cabinet maker, came to Rabbi Yitzchok and pleaded with him. Rabbi, he said, our community is small, but our sorus, our troubles, are great. We need guidance and advice from our elders. Forgive me for asking, but couldn't you and Rabbi Yehuda just occasionally not disagree? <laughs> Rabbi Yitzchok was deeply offended. You ask me this question, he said sharply. Ask Rabbi Yehuda, he's the one who's always disagreeing. <laughs> I'll stop there.